Hello and welcome to today's EHRintelligence.com webcast sponsored by Verado, turning, well, sorry, taking a patient-centered data approach to care delivery. This is Kyle Murphy, Vice President of Content at Extelligent Healthcare Media and moderator of today's presentation. Before moving on, I would like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor. Verado enables healthcare organizations to manage, match, and link their patient data with unprecedented ease, accuracy, scale, and performance, and at the lowest cost. Verado offers two cloud-based patient matching services powered by smart referential matching technology, the new best-in-class EMPI solution, and a powerful plugin that eliminates duplicate records. We will begin with a presentation by our speaker, followed by a question and answer segment. Audience members can submit questions at any time during the webcast using the question tool to the left of their screens. As a HIMSS approved education partner, today's webcast is available for one continuing education credit. For all technical matters or difficulties, click the help icon at the top right hand corner of the screen. A reminder that a copy of the presentation slides is available under event resources to the left of your screens and that a recording of the webcast will be made available following this presentation. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Stan Huff, Chief Medical Informatics Officer at Intermountain and Clinical Professor of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Utah. Stan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to have a chance to, to visit today. I hope I can say something useful and uh, I look forward to, to some questions at the end. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing that I would I would say is um, why why am I interested in in any of this? Uh, and it's implied by the idea of patient centered care, but to just be very explicit, I mean, you know, technology and the standards and and all the other things that we do are a means to an end, and our, our real goal is to help people live the healthiest lives possible. And and that seems a little bit, you know, there's, it doesn't seem like that's a direct connection to patient-centered care, but I would argue that um, the quality of care that we provide is probably the single most important thing uh, for patient satisfaction. And so, you know, uh, having it be easy to make appointments and, and having, you know, uh, convenient locations for people to come to and uh, access to online results and all kinds of things are, are absolutely important and, and improve the patient experience. On the other hand, if we have all of those things and we take poor care of patients, then I don't think we have the patient-centered approach. I think the patient-centered approach has to start with providing really high-quality health care. Uh, and, and the other things are important as well, but I would, I would rate that uh, as important. Um, so I think uh, patient-centered care has to start with, with high-quality care. So, um, why why do we want to work on interoperability, and why do we want to do things? It it comes down to uh, a whole list of things. Again, the 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 top one to me is is improving the quality of care. I think in second place is is making patients happier, and then <laughs> closely related to that is is a decrease in the cost of care because I think some satisfaction comes from from uh, from having a reasonable cost. Uh, in fact, the most reasonable uh, cost for care. Uh, but there are all kinds of other things, and I'm not going to talk so much about some of the other things. Uh, but Standards also enable a learning health system so that we learn from the care that we're providing and we get better because we're, we're, we're learning for that. Uh, we can make systems that make it easier for providers and make providers happier so that they don't have such a big burden uh, to document the care that they provide and we can help them make better decisions. We can improve public health uh, and, you know, Lots of things in the news point to you know ways that we can improve that uh, related to immunizations and uh, disease outbreaks, et cetera. So uh, th that's part of the focus. 
when we talk about um, healthcare, we're in a changing environment. Uh, this is an interesting quote from uh, Sir Cyril Chandler. Medicine used to be simple, ineffective, and relatively safe. And it, it, it hasn't been that long ago, uh, you know, uh, that that was true. And now it's complex, effective, and, and potentially dangerous. Uh, I'm sharing uh, a little bit of personal perspective in this. Um, this this picture is actually of my grandson who was born just um, three months ago. Uh, he was born at 24 weeks. Mother had uh, preeclampsia and uh, had to deliver the baby early to keep the mother safe. Uh, one pound, three ounces. And you, you notice in that picture, that's, that's the mother's, that's the mother's hand. I mean, this it, remarkable to me how, how tiny <laughs> a 1.3 pound baby is. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, moving to the, to, to the next picture, uh, this is, this is the environment, uh, soon after he was born, uh, they're, uh, making preparations to transfer him from uh, the hospital he was born at to, uh, to uh, uh, a newborn intensive care unit that, that had better opportunities to, to help him. And, and, and the point of all this is medicine really is complicated. Uh, it, you know, at any given time, there are, you know, lab data pending, there are information from the ventilator, there information from actual physical exam and, and, and measurements on the patient, the temperature and heart rate and, and all of those kind of things. And cognitive scientists have, have noted that people making decisions can evaluate five or so parameters reliably in making a decision. Um, so it could be plus or minus two, depending on, on how good you are at, at that. But the, the point is uh, that increasingly physicians are uh, faced with these kind of complicated situations. Uh, and knowing and being able to do the, the right thing is is tricky. Uh, so, a couple of quotes. Uh, David Eddy, who's who's a, who's a bright guy, said the the complexity of modern medicine exceeds the inherent limitations of the innate human mind. And of course, that's not always true. Uh, there there I, I would say lots of times when physicians, you know, you're you're just looking, you see. Um, uh, an ear infection, and you, you know you know how to treat that, or you see a fracture or something else. But uh, you get into almost any kind of chronic disease or chronic anticoagulation, or certainly these kind of newborn intensive care units or other adult intensive care units. Uh, making a diagnosis, doing it the most effective way, is increasingly complex, and that's that's where we get into that situation where it's more complex than the unaided human mind. And then Clem McDonald uh, discovered another thing that, again, is sort of intuitive, but is, helps to state, and that is even when we know things, even when we can pass a test to say what the right thing to do is, we don't always do it. We're not perfect information processors. And that might be because we were up all night, because we got interrupted, we get confused between two different patients that have similar names or similar uh, situations, all kinds of reasons that, that we don't do the things we do. But we've proven again and again that physicians and clinicians uh, don't always do what they know. Uh, and, and so that's an opportunity, again, to have computers involved to help help improve the, the quality of care. Now, <clears throat> one of the challenges, though, in uh, providing the highest quality care is uh, creating that, that kind of decision support uh, and coaching environment for clinicians 
And we've done that at Intermountain. Uh, and we have a number of uh, really useful uh, interventions and uh, decision support programs that we provide. Uh, and all of these have been shown to improve the quality of care that we provide, better outcomes at, at lower costs. The tricky thing is that um, we can't we can't keep up. Uh, so I never know exactly how many decision support rules we have or how to count them, but it's in the neighborhood of 150 or 200 or somewhere in there. Uh, we have focused on common diseases, common processes, things where patients have higher risk. Uh, and that's how we've selected what we do. Uh, and so we're we're excited that we can do those things. The thing that we realize is that in in taking better care of patients, um, we have an opportunity to do five thousand things. and And that may sound like an exaggeration, but it's not. Uh, you just think about all of the things that we're not doing anything for. So, uh, we're not doing anything for hyperthyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, myasthenia gravis, fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, you know, you just go down the list of, of the most common diagnoses. And we're, we focused on diabetes mellitus and on congestive heart failure, and, and those are very important things. But in a sense, uh, you know, and, and, that, and that's the right thing to focus on those. But what it means is if you don't do these other things, what you're really saying to people is, um, you know, your, your disease is not common enough that uh, we can provide the best care for you. Uh, we, you know, we, we can't do it. And, and we're never going to get past that uh, unless we get into a standards-based uh, platform situation. And the, uh, the thing that we need to get to is so that if we create something useful at Intermount Healthcare, we can uh, we can share that and other people can use it, not by reprogramming it, but by actually using an executable program to do it. And uh, we need it the other way. We need anything that's created at the Mayo Clinic or Stanford or uh, Washington University or uh, Regan Shreve Clinic or Columbia University or Vanderbilt, uh, you know, uh, all of those places, uh, we need to be able to have them developing some of those 5,000 things and, and we would be able to use them directly in Intermountain Healthcare. So we've got to get to a, a different way of doing things in order to provide the, the best care that we can. Uh, just emphasize uh, Patrick O'Connor talking with him. Uh, they would like to, you know, get their decision support applications into lots of hospitals, but it takes them an average of six months to map needed data elements uh, to a new EHR. It becomes cost prohibitive, and it also means that it is. Uh, you just don't have the resources to get this kind of decision support into community hospitals, uh, you know, two and three hundred bed community hospitals, because they don't have medical informatics staff, um, they don't have the the expertise to administer and 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 have these decision support applications get in place. Uh, I, I want to tell again, uh, this is a true story and a personal story about uh, Eileen, uh, which is why it matters. Uh, Eileen came to a, an HL7 meeting in uh, 2012 in San Antonio, and Eileen lived in Singapore and, and came from Singapore to uh, San Antonio. And when she left Singapore, she was feeling great when she got to um, San Antonio, she had some, some nausea and, and some vomiting and, and uh, a low-grade fever, and uh, she actually came to the, the meeting in the, the first day, but she just didn't feel well enough, and she went back to her room. And then we were in meetings the next day, and we, we, we got word that 
uh, she had collapsed in the hall of the hotel and and she had been transported by uh, ambulance to the nearest hospital, the nearest emergency room. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the law. Basically, the, the, the ambulance guys, if, if a patient can't uh, talk and say where they want to go, then uh, in the case of a, an unconscious patient, they have to take them to um, the closest emergency room. In this case, it was a community hospital with about 300 beds. Uh, she was seen there and she was seen in the emergency room because she was from Singapore. They were thinking of, um, you know, uh, yellow fever, dengue fever, uh, other, you know, tropical diseases, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And she was in the emergency room for about five hours and they, they didn't, they, they did lab tests, took history, uh, they didn't know what was wrong with her, but they could tell obviously that she was ill. So they admitted her to the hospital and put, and, and she was admitted to a, a regular medical floor. And she um, she was she was there waiting for the uh, hospitalist to come and take care of her. And uh, she went into cardiac arrest. And they they took her to the uh, uh, intensive care unit. Uh, she was going into renal failure. Uh, she was now unconscious. And and this story doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, she uh, continued downhill course. I was called uh, in the evening because I was only one of the people that uh, knew Eileen and and her boss, who was also there. Uh, in the U.S. and tried to help and, and communicate with, with the medical staff um, without going into all of the detail, uh, Eileen passed away at uh, about three o'clock in the morning uh, in the ICU. And <clears throat> the, the diagnosis for Eileen was not something tricky, was not something uh, some uh, obtuse tropical disease. She had garden variety group uh, group A strep sepsis. And looking in hindsight at the data that they had in the emergency room, that should have that would have been known. Uh, she had exactly what you would expect in terms of the, the historical findings of sepsis as well as the laboratory findings of, the, of sepsis. And, and so this was a tragic death. And I say tragic because at Intermountain, as well as lots of other places, there are programs in place that would have said, oh, uh, Eileen is at a high risk of sepsis. You need to take blood cultures, you need to immediately start antibiotics, you need to push high volume of fluids. Um, and uh, there is an incredibly high chance that Eileen would have survived had those things been done. And so why is this important? It's important because, again, patient-centered care, I mean, this is such a tragic death. Eileen was in her, uh, in her you know, 30-something, recently married, ran a half marathon two weeks before uh, she died, uh, hoping, you know, planning to be a mother and, uh, and, and an incredibly brilliant medical informaticist from Singapore who was sort of the heir apparent to a lot of the informatics activities in Singapore, and she's dead. Uh, all of that potential and opportunity is gone. And uh, to put that into perspective, uh, studies show, and, and this is not well known, but uh, this is happening incredibly more often than people realize. Uh, the, the best estimates are that 250,000 people a year are dying from preventable medical errors. So this is done, this is inpatient admission. So people who are admitted to the hospital who die in the hospital uh, from preventable medical errors. And um, 
So Eileen's case is not uh, an isolated case. It's actually very common. And to put that into perspective, um, approximately 40,000 people a year die from automobile accidents. So this is, you know, five or six times more common than deaths from automobile accidents. And somehow people don't pay attention to this. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I think maybe some people think there's nothing we can do about it, or maybe others just think it's exaggerated. But certainly my, my both as a physician and as a, as a father and a son and knowing relatives and friends, I believe this number. Uh, because, and you know, as a physician, I might have a little more insight into the fact that there was a medical error. But that's why it's important. That's why we need to be able to share data to take better care of patients and and to make, again, that most important thing, which is is high quality care available to them. So how do we do that? So uh, this this is where sort of the uh, all of the interoperability standards and things come into play. Uh, what we want to do is get into a situation where we're using uh, standards-based services and applications, and that we're specifically uh, think that the, the the best standard that that we have right now is is Fire, the the fast healthcare interoperability resources from HL7. And uh, that needs to be uh, bolstered by uh, some standard clinical uh, re resource profiles, but I won't I won't get into the into the details of that. But in this uh, in this representation, uh, in in the model that we're trying to support, you have uh, EHR systems along the bottom of this slide: Cerner and Allscripts and Epic and and others, and it doesn't have to be EHR systems. It could be uh, a statewide immunization registry or uh, any place that has, uh, it could be a dialysis center that has patient-specific data. And, and what we want to do then is have those systems support standard ways of accessing and storing data. And again, the standard way that we want to do that is, is to store and retrieve data through FHIR interfaces, uh, FHIR services. Uh, that means that if you look at the right upper corner of this slide, that uh, you can build applications, and the applications don't know the structural and technical details of the underlying systems that they're connecting to. Uh, they know and understand the structure of the data as it comes from these fire services, so I can make applications that can be reused uh, any place in, in any system that uh, is adhering to the standards. And, and showing here uh, a neonatal bilirubin management application, a, uh, a patient uh, a pediatric growth chart application, a blood pressure management uh, protocol, et cetera. And, and these things are integrated into the, to the EHR system through the SMART standard. The SMART standard basically says how you can embed a program that you write uh, so that it's callable and executable within the environment of the EHR. So that combination of, of, of the FHIR uh, services uh, for storing and retrieving data and, and SMART means that I can build an application that can run in any, uh, any system that is compliant with the standards, and it's it's different than it is today. This this kind of program uh, can be shared as an executable program. It, you don't have to change it. You don't have to rewrite it. You don't have to have logic in there that says, oh, if I'm talking to Cerner, I do it this way. And if I'm talking to Allscripts, I do it this way, uh, a different way. It's literally the same program, and that program can, can reside uh, in the cloud, on the web, so that when it needs updated or fixed, you can fix it in one place and everybody can use it uh, around the world. And so it offers an opportunity to, to do what I talked about earlier on, and that is actually 
uh, get to that 5,000 other things that we ought to be doing to take better care of patients and, and, and to have uh, a better, higher quality uh, opportunity for those patients. So uh, this, is the, this is the standard. Now, I want to talk about just uh, some, some real impacts. A lot of the early programs that we've made uh, are visual and, uh, you know, interesting, but the kind of programs that are going to have real impact are those programs, for instance, that, that, that uh, help you detect and manage occult sepsis. That's, for instance, the program that would have had an incredibly positive impact on Eileen. Uh, we have other programs, you know, about community-acquired pneumonia, diagnosis and management of pulmonary embolus, management of ICU glucose, uh, ventilator management, uh, public health reporting, uh, chronic uh, management of chronic anticoagulation. All of those things, again, have been shown to not only provide higher quality patient-centered care, but to uh, reduce costs, which also makes patients happier. Uh, those are the things that are going to, those kind of programs are the things that are going to have uh, a real impact. And again, there's a huge opportunity in that space. So uh, just to say a little more about that and, and the implications of having those standardized uh, interfaces and services, uh, Across the top on the left-hand side of this slide, you see uh, the uh, different applications or, or, or different care provider settings uh, where I have a, 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 a disease registry, uh, a diabetes management uh, application, uh, a specialist who might be a specialist in rheumatology or some other area. And today, if they want to take care of the patient, uh, they have to have different interfaces for each different EHR that they talk to. And, uh, and as you can see, you end up then with, with a whole bunch of interfaces. The fact that those interfaces are all different colors, it means that you did work, individual work, with every one of those uh, applications in order to, to make the data, uh, to, to get the data and to do the mapping to make the data available to those programs. And so, when you look at the right side, what we're talking about is, is plug and play or what sometimes called semantic interoperability, where uh, you know each EHR has to figure out how to get to the standard and each application has to figure out how to get to the standard. But you don't have every application having to figure out how to get to each EHR. Uh, and each EHR doesn't have to figure out how to provide the data in a different way for each application. And so it's, it's, it's incredibly less work to be able to create applications that they can share, and you have less work and, and uh, less mapping of data in order to support that. So what that means, for instance, is that uh, another part of this is if you're taking care of a patient who has data in more than one EHR, you can you can do that uh, in in a reasonable way. In other words, uh, real time, I can ask for data that I need from each one of the EHRs or each each place that the patient has data, and I integrate that data in my application. I don't have to move the data, all of the data from one EHR to another EHR to another EHR. Uh, I don't have to copy that data, and uh, and so that's one of the uh, the things that this does as well is that it minimizes the duplication of data. You don't have to copy the data to every new place the patient get, goes to. You can access it real time at its source, and so this is a new opportunity. We're not taking advantage of that uh, very much yet. Uh, but this is really the way that you want to do it in the future so that you don't have to copy data and make multiple copies of the data and worry about the redundancy and the overhead of copying data, but just accessing it through standard services and providing the care that you need real time, uh, accessing the data at its original source. So uh, another way to think about this is uh, really 
thinking about it in much the same kind of paradigm as applications on your iPhone or, or Android. Uh, that is, you can make now a library of applications in an app store, in a healthcare app store, that uh, those applications can be used in all scripts. They can be used in Cerner. They can be used on Epic in the same way that uh, iPhone apps can be used on your iPhone or anybody else's iPhone, and also on Android. Uh, and and one of the key things is the um, that you can have a personal health record, uh, and so those applications are available to the patient or to the person, and you don't have to. Uh, again, uh, you're now making available to them knowledge and capability and decision-making opportunities that um, mimic the app store. So the things that they need and want, uh, they, they can access and use out of, out of a common set of programs and not worry about having to have a different program for every different EHR system and each dif different patient repository. So it provides a, a real uh, opportunity and uh, improvement. And, and so it's a different set of applications now that you know, would be patient-centered act activities like scheduling appointment, uh, uh, diagnostic algorithms where they could enter their signs or symptoms and, and get an idea of what kind of disease process is going on, medication refills, enroll in a clinical trial, ask a question of a care provider, review results from tests that have been done. All of those things now uh, we can make increasingly better and better and more convenient uh, act. Uh, applications for uh, a patient to use on their own and and not only use on their own but integrate their care with their caregiver and and their activities and signs and symptoms so it offers a whole new opportunity uh, now another thing that this this is a different aspect of this uh, and 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 this is it but it's another opportunity to really improve the quality of, of care that is provided, and that is uh, to change the way that we think about data and, and collecting data. So right now, down, down the left-hand side of this slide, we have, have the real world where activities are happening in the real world, and that I've got you know the illustration is sort of something that was happening in a laboratory, but it could be uh, a physical exam, it could be blood pressures and heart rates, vital signs, uh, any of those things that happen in the real world. And what happens today, unfortunately, is that um, when something happens in the real world, when they create the representation of that data in the digital world, it takes a different shape and a different color. And those shapes and colors are meant to represent, if you will, the structure of the data and then the coded terminology that's used to represent the data. And what happens today is that every system creates their own structure, their own internal structures, and they, they have their own internal uh, terminologies. There are things going on now, uh, I don't want to underestimate the, the things, that, that there are really promising things going on in people starting to use standard terminologies, but uh, it's, it's not that common yet and we need to improve, but the this is literally what's happening, you know, 99% of the time is that when something happens in the real world, when, when that uh, data gets represented, that information gets represented in the digital world, it's different from every, in every system that, that is using the, uh, the, that is storing the data. And of course, what that means for uh, reusing the data is, in fact, that you have to have some process that transforms the data to a common representation before you can use it for population health or for uh, caring for patients in that interoperability paradigm. And uh, so each system has to transform the data. And, and so there's work and that becomes a barrier to, you, to reusing the data because there's work and mapping that has to go on in order to transform the data into a common um, uh, shape and terminology, a common structure and terminology. 
and you'll notice too and and it's by intention that the 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 shapes in fact are slightly different colors and and that represents to the fact that typically when you have to transform data you have some loss of fidelity of the data you have a loss of information because the the representations are not entirely equivalent and so you're also not also is it hard to do but it's imperfect in the way that you transform data and make it available. So we're trying to get to a, 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 a situation where instead of that limited knowledge sharing, we have this situation. Uh, as soon as data is created, it's created in a common structure with a common terminology. So the data, if you will, is ready to use in a, in a totally uh, standardized fashion and there's no barrier now I don't have to have another program transform the data in order to use it in decision support or to provide it to a patient at their home or uh, to provide it to uh, a public health service it's ready to use as it was created and so you, you you know if we can get to this kind of structure in the system this kind of uh, uh, implementation it'll reduce an incredible amount of, of work and cost uh, in systems as we know them today so um, that in that scenario we, we have no barrier to sharing of knowledge and applications so so where are we at today uh, you know fire HL7 fire is is easy to implement uh, there's unprecedented support from EHR vendors and from government agencies and others uh, to use fire and to produce that interoperability layer uh, we have experience at Intermountain Healthcare and collaborating with the University of Utah to, so that we know that um, it really works it's not that there's not you know it, it's going to continue to improve and and get better and we need to add knowledge to make sure that it's done the same way in each implementation of fire but it really does work and and that is gaining momentum from the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking uh, items that came out from CMS and from uh, the office of the national coordinator that HL7 fire uh, be proposed as a requirement for certifying uh, EHR systems and, and for transmission of data. Uh, so we're making real progress and that's, that's exciting. So uh, one, one kind of last um, uh, thought about interoperability is an idea of, that there are levels of interoperability one of the challenges sometimes is people talk about interoperability without being explicit about what they mean and in fact there's not just one kind of interoperability there are multiple kinds of levels or types of interoperability and and so it's useful to just explain that a little bit so for instance we have HL7 version 2 standard that is in you know almost every institution very close to 100% of institutions are using HL7 version 2 and that's providing value uh, in and of itself uh, at that level though it, it has a common structure the, the HL7 message has a common structure but it there aren't terminology constraints there are no requirements about how uh, you use terminology in that standard and so it, it means that you you have to map to get to the degree of interoperability that you want you have to map local terminologies to standard terminologies and uh, there's a lot of work there so again the next sort of layer uh, the next generation if you will is this HL7 fire compliance uh, and and fire uh, is is a is a is a, a real improvement on version 2 uh, it has common structures and and for instance it, it adds terminology constraints and indicates in particular areas what what terms and codes should be used what LOINC codes should be used what SNOMED codes should be used so that you get a much more standardized representation of the data 
there's there are yet two more uh, levels of, of higher level interoperability. One one level is is from the Argonauts. Uh, the Argonauts are a group uh, of uh, interested providers and as well as EHR vendors who have come together to um, to make further specification on on the fire standard. And so uh, they they have standard extensions. They have specified specific point codes and SNOMED codes. So they've added even more information to, to make the, the interface uh, standard. And then the highest level or this level of semantic interoperability that I'm calling HSPC compliance. HSPC is a, is a not-for-profit organization that uh, Intermountain, LSU, and uh, the VA uh, hospitals uh, created to 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 move towards this truly semantic interoperability level, and at that level, uh, there's one preferred structure. There there are completely standardized extensions, explicit loin codes and SNOMED codes, units of measure, magnitude of numbers, and so it's that highest level that gets you to that vision that that I talked about earlier, where the uh, you can make an application. And it can be used on anybody's system who has who has achieved that level of interoperability. Now, I, I would just emphasize that all of these levels are are worthwhile and add value. And you don't get to that top layer without work and uh, a lot of effort. And so we want to, you know, we need to sort of grow into this new environment because it's going to take time and experience to to really reach that. But it will have an incredible value to healthcare when we get to that much more interoperable situation. So, what could we do if we share, you know, if we could share executable knowledge, if we really had that ability to make an application and share it everywhere and have it be smart and um, and and proven to take better care of patients? Uh, you know, we might save 100,000 lives a year. Uh, physicians might make the decision 80% of the time. I didn't say this earlier, but studies have shown that uh, on average providers uh, make the right decision for their patients about 50% of the time. Uh, there are huge chart abstraction costs that we could avoid uh, in, in creating quality registries and learning from, from the data that we have. Um, and we could learn from the $3.2 trillion worth of healthcare we provide. We could answer all kinds of observational questions uh, if we had the data ready to use and ready to analyze. Uh, and hopefully we could reduce the software cost so that installing EHRs uh, in large systems costs a few million dollars instead of billions of dollars. So there's an incredible opportunity for, for patient-centered care as well as improving the quality of care if we, can, if we can make and take better advantage of those standards and, and true interoperability. Um, so uh, I'll stop there. I'll, I'll turn it back to Kyle to sort of manage the question and answer period here. Uh, but again, it's been my pleasure to have this opportunity to present today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Huff. That was an incredible presentation. For anybody who needed a, a quick quick and easy run-up of uh, interoperability advancements in, in healthcare, I think you just got a really great one. So let's kick it off with, uh, with our first question. Um, back to um, the early part of the presentation, um, Stan, when you were talking about um, open source and some of the work you guys are, are doing at Intermountain, uh, can you comment on the types of programs that you guys are developing with open source in mind? So, uh, a couple of pro, yeah, I, I can mention a couple. One, one is uh, we we created uh, in we created a pediatric growth chart application. Um, actually, we it was it was created at Boston Children's Hospital, and then we imported that, uh, and and then created the fire services that we needed to you know to make that work. And and we learned a lot doing that. So that's one. Another one is the neonatal bilirubin application. Uh, that went a different way. Uh, we've we've done 
uh, elect, you know, uh, assisted computer support uh, in management of neonatal bilirubin for a number of years. But it was a it was a uh, locally developed program at Intermountain. We we took that program. The University of Utah sort of took the knowledge and and rules that we had, and they created a, a smart on fire application. Uh, for the neonatal bilirubin management. So they made that a, a standard smart on fire application. Another area where we're working uh, actively is a fire, smart on fire application for uh, pulmonary embolus diagnosis and management. Peter Haug uh, here at uh, Intermountain and, and clinical colleagues who are working in that area. And then we've got a bunch of others in the pipeline, but that gives you a feel maybe for some of the applications that we're actively working on uh, in that with with that open architecture. All right, moving on to the next question, I'm going to combine the two. That one one of them uh, talks specifically about patient generated data. Another talks about patient entered data. Um, how how do how do you foresee those two different sources? of data uh, impacting your interoperability strategy at Intermountain? So there's a huge opportunity. We're not, we're not doing much there yet. Um, and, you know, the way that would happen, we would like those sources of information to be uh, fire compliant, if you will, uh, semantically interoperable, so that any data that's collected, whether it's collected by the patient or by a device in the home or where, wherever it starts out, that that data now becomes available and is, you know, can be written and stored uh, into the patient's electronic record uh, using those fire services. And so it, it provides an incredible new source of, of information uh, to take better care of the patient. Uh, you know, it, things that are happening, for instance, are that uh, by watching, uh, understanding, for instance, uh, a patient's weight uh, and uh, other signs and symptoms that the patient would enter, uh, we would be able to predict if somebody is getting into trouble with their asthma or with their COPD or with uh, congestive heart failure and, and would be able to intervene earlier so that the patient doesn't end up going to the emergency room or being hospitalized. Uh, when, in fact, uh, medication changes could be made or, or uh, a, home, uh, a home nurse could be dispatched to, uh, to take care of the patient early uh, and, and prevent complications or expensive interventions later. And so those, uh, again, if we can make those data interoperable and make them available to clinical decision support programs, uh, we can we can uh, help the patient earlier and in a more convenient and cost effective way and so those those sources of data patient centered data coming from from the home or home home devices are a, a real uh, valuable opportunity that we have uh, that we're not taking advantage of yet um, next question here Stan um, can you speak to uh, I guess the 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 role that I think in this instance, fire, but but having advancements in, in interoperability going to play in um, certain areas of care that require um, much more intensive uh, care coordination, um, I would say in terms of kind of cancer panels. Can you speak to the importance of of having these capabilities in order to to allow these kind of unique care teams to come together? Yeah. Uh you know the situation you have in in those in those kind of advanced situations oftentimes it it's crossing different environments and and of course one of the really important environments is home i mean that you know hopefully patients are rarely in the hospital or in a clinic uh and and so having you know the data from home but those complicated cancer patients, for instance, may be seen uh, and, and being managed by a person who's a surgeon who, who helps with surgery on a cancer, uh, and then uh, an oncologist who's, who's managing chemotherapy, uh, also uh, a radiation oncology who's managing radiation uh, related to that disease. And, and what you're hoping is that 
the standards would alight, enable all of those uh, participants, the patient, the uh, surgeon, oncologists, to, uh, to see the same data, to be able to share information seamlessly uh, so that uh, there's not loss of information. Each, each one of those participants knows what's happening uh, and uh, you create knowledge that uh, improves based on uh, the care that's being provided so that people, you, you know, uh, receive uniformly better care because they're, they're following, you know, known best practices, if you will, that are implemented in the software itself. We have a couple of questions here, uh, Stan, on kind of um, new kind of emergent technologies. A uh, question here about artificial intelligence. Um, I would like to add to that uh, blockchain, but what kind of role do you see some of these technologies playing once you get, once you kind of, uh, once the industry adopts this kind of smart on, on fire approach to, to information sharing? So it, it just accelerates uh, our ability to advance in those other areas. So with artificial intelligence, they're, they're kind of two, two big parts to improving the quality of care. One is learning new things and, and understanding and, and gaining new knowledge. And, and you could char characterize, you know, a lot of the AI sort of applications and deep learning and, um, uh, you know, data mining kinds of, of, of things, they're, they're about learning new knowledge and gaining new insight. And then there's the other part of that that is uh, actually creating interventions, creating programs that integrate with, with clinical workflow that say, oh, given this situation, this is, this is a point where, uh, you know, based on this patient's signs and symptoms, we need to treat for occult sepsis or we need to, uh, we need to do these laboratory tests to see if uh, there's a pulmonary embolus going on or, or that sort of thing. And so, uh, that there there are artificial intelligence sort of in in both of those areas one is you know artificial intelligence is helping with machine learning and um, all of the sort of big data uh, analytics activities etc and that's helped because the data is ready to analyze they, it doesn't have to be converted or changed in order for the analysis to take place and so that accelerates you know the use of ai and medicine uh, based on the standards. And then on the other hand, you have other kinds of artificial intelligence like uh, Bayesian networks and neural networks and uh, tools uh, like Drools and other uh, uh, decision-making uh, engines that now those engines can be applied, again, to a common substrate. So I don't have to rewrite or change the rules based on each system that I'm talking to. And so uh, that accelerates our ability to create programs that improve health, artificial intelligence programs that improve health. And I don't have to make a different flavor or a different version with each institution where I'm implementing. Excellent. Now, a question that I imagine you've heard before Stand, but one that that bears repeating. Uh, what do you think are the are the major obstacles currently uh, in the way of, of of achieving semantic interoperability in healthcare? So, the number one thing may seem odd. Um, the number one thing I would say is not technical. Uh, the number one thing is incentives. Uh, I, the we we have to have. Uh, the financial part of medicine set up so that people have a financial incentive to take better care of patients and uh, to improve the quality of care that they provide. Uh, and I say that because, because if, if, if there's no incentive, uh, the technical things don't matter because if, uh, if the financial incentive is that uh, I can make more money by doing more procedures and prescribing more medications and taking care of complications, then the, unfortunately that's, that's what happens. Uh, people follow the money. And, 
so we have to have a situation, you know, and, and, and this is already going on. People are already doing it, but it, you know, they're, they're bundled payments, uh, value-based healthcare, uh, pay for performance, uh, accountable care organizations, all of those kind of things where people become more accountable for the quality that they're providing. And that in, in that environment, then the things that we're talking about with interoperability make financial sense, not just quality healthcare sense. And so uh, that's the most important thing. But then in terms of technical barriers, it's, it's uh, getting to that highest level of interoperability requires a lot of work. It requires mapping of existing systems to standards. It requires uh, augmenting uh, the fire standard with very specific profiles so that we have truly standardized representations of the vocabulary and terminology. And so, um, you know, that's sort of the technical barrier is, is further enhancement of the, of the standards and getting those implemented globally across the, um, the ecosystem. And then another follow-up on the issue of uh, standards is, um, I guess, how sensitive are, to, are, are the folks um, working on fire at HL7? I know it's a, it's a it's, it's, it's contributors to it um, come from across healthcare, but in, in terms of making sure that uh, the standards are not too restrictive to to kind of keep the door open for for new sources of data information down the road that they don't necessarily get locked out. Yeah, I mean that's very important, uh, and I would say in a different way too that that the what what the content is, if you will, needs to be driven by clinicians, not not by the standards body. So you need you need frontline clinicians saying what is needed and what's what's valuable in order to direct the standards activities uh, and make sure that they're focused in the right areas. And you know, I don't think there's anything in fire. There's nothing uh, that that would prevent us from creating you know, new representations or better representations for genomic data or uh, patient-entered data or data that's coming from new devices. All of those things are, uh, you, you know, can be accommodated. We just have to watch and, and make sure that we're doing it uh, and involve frontline clinicians in that, in that decision-making. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that uh, we have time for today. And that concludes today's EHRintelligence.com presentation. A special thanks to our speaker, Dr. Stan Huff, our audience, and our sponsor, Verado. From the team at Excelligent Healthcare Media, I'd like to say thank you and goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.